It is such a privilege to welcome you warmly in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ on this beautiful Sunday morning as we gather together to thank God for the gift of another perfect day and to praise and worship and glorify Him. I pray that you have a time to count your many blessings this week. And I like to share this Bible verse, which happens to be my catchphrase, to banish the gloom in times of trials. It is the first verse of Psalm 27, which says, The Lord is my light and salvation, who shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Yes, despite the challenging times of our wilderness experience, the social isolation, the uncertainty that surrounds us yet, He is our light and stronghold. And we are grateful for His mercies, His protection, His provision on all of us and our loved ones, for our nation and world at large. We will continue to stay focused on our Lord Jesus Christ with our eyes on Him, because only in Him that we can find fullness of joy. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Most merciful and gracious Father, thank you for bringing us together to worship and glorify you, Father God. And we thank you for the manifold blessings that you have showered upon us, the protection and provision in the last week, and as we go into a new week, you will be with us to guide us all the way. Father God, I commit this service and all those who are watching the service into your loving care. In your name we pray. Amen.
You've done before in greater measure. You will do again. Cause there's no reason why you can break through. No mountain you can move. All things are possible. There's no broken body you can raise. No so that you
just praise you and worship you, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you have defeated, Lord. You have defeated everything, Lord. Every curse, every stronghold is broken. The chains are broken. The chains have hit the ground, Lord. And we ask you, Lord, right now, just pour out your spirit, Lord. Come awaken our spirits, Lord. Lord, awaken, Lord, our minds, Lord. Lord, awaken our lost hope, Lord. Awaken our bodies, Lord. Awaken our entire beings, Lord. Lord, we know, Lord, that when we awaken, Lord, we can, Lord, go and awaken the city, Lord. Revive us, Lord. Revive us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You are an awesome God, Lord. And we worship you. We love you, Lord. We worship you. Awesome God. Loving Father. We bless you. We worship you. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning church this morning i'm going to be sharing with you on the importance of peace being our greatest weapon of warfare to get to the other side as many of you are aware i shared a word in december uh, on december 31st and subsequently in march that peace is going to be our greatest weapon of warfare uh, for the year 2021 you know as we as we shared this word both times you know we really didn't we were unaware of what was really going to unwind in our nation today when i look back being in the month of september i started realizing that very clearly i can understand why god gave us this key that peace is going to be our greatest weapon of warfare uh, for this year you know i remember in in january um, after i shared this word on, on 31st night 
I had someone who came and spoke to me and said, he said, you know, Suren, is, are you trying to say that this year is going to be a year of challenges and full of challenges? And are you speaking doom and gloom? So which I responded and I said, I really don't know what the year is going to look like. But one thing we know for sure is that Jesus has given us a very clear key. And that key is that peace is going to be our greatest weapon of warfare that's going to help us to get to the other side uh, in, in 2021. You know, and uh, a, f a few weeks ago, I was actually just really, uh, uh, when I was praying for the nation and I was uh, really praying for all that's taking place around us, there's so much happening. I was asking uh, Jesus and saying, Jesus, what are you saying for, the, for this time and what do we need to do? And he started reminding me of this message that I shared with you, uh, you know, at the beginning of the year. And um, I just felt him say, here is one of the important keys that you need for this year. And, uh, and, and there was a stirring on my heart and just the importance to reawaken this message and re-look at it uh, in this season that we are living in. So I was really asking the Lord and I said, Jesus, what are you really trying to say? Are you asking me to re-share this word? Is this something that we need to look at once again? Especially because um, so much has kind of uh, unfolded in this year. And uh, even as I was talking to him about this, a few days later, I had a friend of mine who's actually part of a different church, a different denomination, who, who called me up one Sunday after their Sunday service. And he said, Suren, I just want to tell you that I really sent something from the Lord. So I said, uh, yeah, I said, please do share. And he said, uh, you know, I really feel you need to share that word uh, about peace with the church once again. So when I heard that, I realized God was confirming, you know, I was asking the Lord, Jesus, uh, what is your heart? Is this something we need to really look at? And he definitely did confirm. So today, you know, I just want you to keep your hearts open and we're going to really look at this um, message once again, this key that Jesus gave us for the entire year where he said, peace is going to be our greatest weapon of warfare uh, for 2021. So, maybe, you know, let's start with looking at the word of God and let's read from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 40. It starts by saying, wind and wave obey Jesus. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, I want you to give a thought on that, just or, or keep your mind on that word. Let us cross over to the other side. Verse 36, now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. I love that part. And they awoke him, and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Right? So they wake up, they wake him up and said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. You know, an amazing story of what took place. When Jesus was crossing over to the other side, this storm came, and, and you know, the story is very self-explanatory. But, you know, what we need to really look at to understand the story better, we really need to see what really took place on the other side and and because this kind of really puts the entire story into context and if you keep reading you know uh, in mark chapter 5 it says that the other side was really the country of the gadarenes see and, and when we started we read you know that he was about to get to the other side so what took place on the other side and when we read scripture we see that 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 jesus got was getting on to the other side, which was the country of Gadarenes. Now, what was significant about the country of the Gadarenes? In the country of the Gadarenes, there was actually a, 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 a man who was demon-possessed. And he was actually tormenting this entire region. You know, and I just want you to think with me on this. This man, this man was demon-possessed and like he would be tied up and but he would torment the entire village. He would uh, torment the entire region. And, and you can imagine that this entire region lived from a place of fear. They lived from a place of 
uncertainty, of anxiousness, of, of not knowing what's going to happen. You know, they were living with torment. They did not know when this man is going to strike. And just imagine living in a place like that. What would that look like for families? What would that look like for individuals? And I believe the, the, the very atmosphere of the, camp, uh, of the country of the Gadarenes was filled with fear, confusion, you know, anxiety, worry. And, and if I may say this way, the region of uh, th this region never was able to walk into their fullest destiny. They were never able to walk into their fullest potential. They were never able to fulfill all that this region was called to do because fear had gripped them because there was uncertainty because there was someone who was tormenting the entire region so kind of this region was robbed from actually living out its fullest destiny now why is this important because we can really draw a lot of parallels from this story and apply it to what we are seeing as a nation today you know this story shows us that how there are times when there is a demonic presence that affects the well-being of a nation, where there is a demonic oppression or a torment that comes in over a nation and prevents a nation from going, in, going into its fullest destiny, right? And, and if, we, if we really look at this uh, story, we can see that Jesus was trying to get to the other side. But what took place was a storm prevented him from getting to the other side there was a storm that came that was preventing him now why is this important i believe that the storm was demonic in nature the storm that jesus and his disciples faced on the boat was demonic in nature you know it was where the enemy was coming against jesus to prevent him prevent him from getting to the other side why I believe the enemy knew that if Jesus conquered the storm, which he did, and if he got to the other side, which he did, right, that an entire region would be set free and would be able to walk into their fullest destiny and potential. You know, families, homes, uh, people, and this entire region would start living a life of, if I may say it this way, of prosperity, of, of, of health, of, of uh, wholeness like never before, right? And, and so the enemy knew that if he could stop Jesus from coming there, that the country of Gadarenes will be in a place of, you know, would be kind of suppressed and, 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 and uh, it wouldn't walk into its fullest destiny. Now, this is something so important uh, for us to look at. Because we can see that there is so much that we can draw for our, um, for our nation during this time. Now, if we look at the story, we see that the storm came. And what did Jesus do? Jesus was fast asleep on the boat. Right? He's fast asleep. So the storm has come. The winds have picked up. The waves are huge. You know, the boat is rocking. But Jesus is so calm fast asleep on the boat amazing unreal unbelievable right and the disciples waking up out of so much of fear and panic and they say wake up you know aren't you uh, interested that we are going to uh, you know that uh, aren't you concerned of us you know we're going to die and it said that the, the you know the, the water was filling the the boat and sometimes with all that's taking place around us in our nation today you know it's something like that Suddenly, we are feeling that, oh my goodness, we're facing storms on all fronts. It seems almost like as if we are about to start drowning. And you're like, what are we going to do? It's not just the COVID factor, but every single place we look, we are beginning to see challenges in every sense. And they're not just challenges. These challenges are quite large in nature. And, 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 and suddenly, we're like, it, it actually feels that we're drowning. Right? But Jesus did the most profound thing, church, at this time. You know, so he wakes up and he sees the storms rising and coming against him and trying to resist him from getting to the other side. And what does Jesus do? You know, Jesus realizes, okay, 
there's resistance, there's warfare, and I need to come against it. So what does he do? He kind of opens up his armory, and what does he pull out? He didn't go into prayer. He didn't go into a 21-day prayer. He didn't go into a 41-day prayer. He didn't start interceding. He didn't start uh, praying in the language of the Holy Spirit. Now, even as I say that, I need to tell you, I'm not discounting that at all. Please, you know, the, the scriptures tell us that there's power in prayer. The only way a nation would be saved is through prayer. But, but what I'm trying to bring out is that there was an emphasis on what he came against uh, the powers of darkness with. And he came against it with the weapon of peace. He just said, peace, be still. And Jesus was emphasizing that to us very clearly. Where he, did, he, he came against the storm and said, peace, be still. Now, this is profound, church. You know, because he didn't pull out any other weapon. He could have said something different. But he spoke peace. Right? And, and I believe that this is such a model for you and I, especially in a time like this when we are, uh, are seeing so much take place in our nation. You know, today there's so much of uncertainty, there's so much of hopelessness, there's fear, there's sorrow, there's mourning that's taking place. You know, our economy is challenged, the, the rupee is beginning to weaken, you know, the rupee is weakening. There are food shortages, you know, imports have been restricted, um, you know, the COVID factor, there's so much more taking place. But through all of this, you know, we can draw a lot of strength from the story. And like I said, it feels like as if you're about to, uh, you know, that we're drowning. I hear people say, oh my gosh, just when we saw one thing starting to clear out, 10 new things have popped up. How are we going to lift our head? And, 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 and there's so much of a negative picture that we're beginning to see, all right? But I want to tell you that when we look at this story, we can see, you know, we can draw so much of a parallel and we can see that, you know, God has great plans for our nation. But right now, there is a storm preventing us from going to the other side, from reaching out to the other side, to go and place our feet on the other side. And I believe that this, that what we're seeing is, is a war against the destiny of our nation right now. And the word of God shows us the key on how we can overcome the war that comes against destiny of a region and a nation. And that is with peace. And I'll keep explaining to you. But before, you know, but before we go any further, you know, we did speak about the negative that's taking place over our nation. But I need to re-remind you of the promises of God for our nation, of the prophetic words that, that have been spoken over our nation. You know, the prophetic words have been that Sri Lanka will be this beautiful pearl in the Indian Ocean. How is a pearl formed? Through much irritation. But I want to tell you, out comes a pearl. And I believe we are going to see a pearl come out of all of this, right? But the prophetic words for our nation has been that we would be a prototype, that Sri Lanka would be a model nation, that we would be the Antioch of Asia. The prophetic word is that Sri Lanka would be a nation where God's glory would be visible, that we would be a healing nation, that we would be a nation where the economy is blessed, that there would be value addition and we would be a nation that sends out so much to different parts of the world. That we would be a hub for trade. And the, the, you know, the, the, the prophetic words over Sri Lanka are just beautiful and amazing. It talks about how we would be this model. It also talks about how there's going to be so much of natural resources that are going to be found on the soil of this land. And it's going to have a blessing for the generations to come, right? And, and I just want us to re remind ourselves that there is the other side of all of this. And it's, I believe it's happening now. We are right now in a season where we're feeling and we're sensing and we're seeing the storm come against us. 
But please understand that the storm that's arising is coming against us getting to the other side, is coming against Sri Lanka walking in to its fullest destiny. And one of the key ways that we can birth what God wants to do for our nation, for our people, for our children, for a generation, one of the, one of the keys is, is the key of peace, releasing and declaring peace over every place of conflict over this nation. So, very simply, what is the meaning of peace? What does this word peace mean? Peace comes from the, uh, from the Hebrew word shalom. And if you look at what it means, it means wholeness. It means a coming together. It means a completeness, right? So a coming together, wherever it's fragmented, wherever things are broken, wherever things are in disarray, or wherever there is, uh, you know, it's, it's just a coming together of wholeness, of completeness. You know, a, a Jewish rabbi uh, gave an amazing uh, statement. He said, you know what the opposite of peace is? And most often we would say the opposite of peace is war. But the opposite of peace he said, is pieces, P-I-E-C-E-S, pieces. In other words, when peace comes in, everything that's broken, everything that's out of sync, just comes into a place of divine alignment and, uh, you know, in, where the harmony of heaven rests upon it. And that is what takes place when, when we use this word shalom. And that's the depth and the meaning of this word shalom. You know, if we keep uh, doing a greater word study on the word shalom or, or peace, in, in Hebrew, you know, the Hebrew language is all these pictorial forms and it's these little uh, pictorial letters. And, and through that, we can derive two amazing um, definitions for the word peace. And when we analyze those words, we can, uh, we can gather that peace would mean the spirit that breaks down chaos and the spirit that destroys false authority. I'll say that again. It's a spirit, peace is the spirit that destroys chaos. And, and, and it's a spirit that destroys false authority. Sorry, it's a spirit that breaks down chaos, not destroys chaos, that breaks down chaos. Right? And that is what happens every single time, church, you and I declare peace. It breaks down chaos. It brings things back into divine order and divine alignment so that the peace of God, the harmony of heaven can rest on, right? And, and it's amazing. And I, I really think that, I, I don't think we have ever captured the depth and the meaning and the richness of this word peace. You know, often in, a, in, in Christian language, you know, we see it in the word, but even with each other, we use the word peace, peace be with you, peace. And we see, you know, uh, where Jesus spoke peace, we see how the angels appeared to the shepherd boys and said peace. You know, so many places in the word, the word peace was used, peace, peace, fear not, peace. You know, and, and I really believe that when this word peace was being said, there's something that shifts so strongly in the very atmosphere. And, and I believe God is awakening us into the truth of that in a greater measure during this time and during this season. So, what is peace? So, let me say it this way. What is peace? Peace is not a thing. It's not just a feeling, oh, I'm feeling peace. It's not a feeling. It's not a thing. It's not even a substance. But peace is not the absence of something, but it's the presence of someone. I'll say that again. Peace is not the absence of something, but it's the presence of someone. You know, let's look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. You know, this is a scripture all of us use so often during the times of Christmas. And it says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us and the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus Christ, 
you know, it says that for unto us a child is born. And his name shall be called. He's be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father. But it ends with, and he is the Prince of Peace. You know, peace is a person. And he's a person to be encountered. Isn't that amazing, church? Let's look at 2 Thessalonians 3.16. It says, now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. You know, again, the scripture very clearly says that he is the Lord of peace. He is the Lord of peace. Peace is a person. And he said, may the Lord of peace continually grant you peace in every circumstance. Let's look at Romans 16, 20. I just love this verse. It says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. The God of peace. And I love it. He's saying the God of peace will soon crush Satan under whose feet? Under your feet and my feet. How does that happen? Because when Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, lives in us, you know, he lives in us and he works through us. And th because we have him living in us, Satan will be crushed under your feet and my feet. Even as we engage with the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, may I encourage you during this time to really be intentional, to talk to him, to invite him as the Prince of Peace. He is a person to be encountered. So I want to share with you, you know, a few important things. And one is declaring his peace brings perspective and enables us with the supernatural courage. I'll say that again. Declaring his peace brings perspective and, and enables us with supernatural courage. Let's look at John 14 verses 27. Jesus says, I leave the gift of peace with you, my peace, not the kind of fragile peace given by the world, but my perfect peace. Don't yield to fear or be troubled in your hearts. Instead, be courageous. You know, church, it's amazing what peace does. You know, when we declare peace, it helps us to bring perspective to what's taking place. And it enables us with supernatural courage. You know, in this verse, we see that God, where Jesus comes and says, My peace, I give you. My peace, I give you. Not the kind of fragile peace given by the world. See, the, the world will give us a peace that doesn't last long. But he is the Prince of Peace, the true peace, the everlasting peace. And he says, I give that peace to you. And then he says this, he says, don't yield to fear or be troubled in your hearts. Instead, be courageous. Church, isn't it amazing that because of the Prince of Peace, because of peace, and when we model the life of Jesus and release peace, we don't have to yield to fear. We don't have to be overtaken with the troubles and the fears and what we're seeing around. But it's said that it enables us to be courageous. Instead, be courageous. I believe because of the Prince of Peace living in you and I today, you and I are empowered with courage to be able to face the storm and declare peace over every storm that's arising against the destiny of your family, of your home, of your marriage, of your children, but most importantly, over the destiny of our nation. The second point that I want to share with us uh, is that we are commissioned to release peace. You and I are commissioned to release peace. You know, John 20, 21, we are in a year, Jesus has been talking to us about peace being our greatest weapon of warfare in 2021. And interestingly, John 20, 21 says this. It says, again, Jesus said, peace be with you as the Father has sent me. I'm sending you, right? This was a commissioning. We know when Jesus came, Jesus came and said, I am the light of the world. And then before he left, he said, you are the light of the world. There was a baton 
uh, change that took place. He empowered us now to be the light of the world. And then, you know, Jesus says, peace be with you. He comes and declares, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. You know, you and I are commissioned now to release peace wherever we go, to be aware of the Prince of Peace living in us and making declarations that when you and I speak peace over the economy, speak peace over the situation that's taking place, speak when we intentionally declare and, and speak peace over, let's say, the, 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 the COVID situation, we're speaking and we're saying for the spirit that breaks down chaos, to come in. We are declaring for the spirit that breaks down false authority, that brings wholeness and oneness into that situation. So church, you and I are commissioned to do that. And I want to encourage you, you know, let's just go out there. Let's receive that supernatural courage and, and declare peace over every storm that we see over our nation. The third one that I want to share with you and remind you on is that peace uh, the weapon of peace births joy. I'll say that again. The weapon of peace births joy. Let's read John 20 verses 19 to 20. It says, Jesus appears, appears to his disciples. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood amongst, among them and said, Peace be with you. Verse 20, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. This is an amazing story, a beautiful picture that I want to uh, explain to you. You know, this happened, this story took place uh, the very next day after Jesus rose again. So it was evening. The disciples there, they were locked. They, 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 were, they were very fearful, it says. They, they had locked the doors. They gathered in a room. They were there, probably not even talking loud, whispering, having just a small candlelight, just a little bit of food. You know, just imagine what, what, what was going through their mind. You know, after three and a half years of journeying with Jesus, suddenly everything is lost. They don't know what has happened. Confusion has set in. Uncertainty of the future. They are fearful that now it could be them. That someone might come and knock on the door and it, you know, they would be you know, taken in. And, and just imagine the fear, the anxiety. You know, and probably destiny. Well, they, they felt like their destiny and the future was robbed. And they are in this place of absolute uncertainty. And just imagine what that atmosphere would have felt like charged with negative emotion right and fear having gripping them no hope an absolute hopeless situation inside that room look what happens jesus walks in what's the first thing jesus says peace he just says peace church friends i want you to think with me why didn't he use any other word why didn't he come and say Guys, it's me! I'm risen! Or why didn't he say, Love! Joy! Jesus, it's me! You know, mentioning his own name. But he just comes and says, He says, Peace be with you. This story is such a prophetic image of what takes place when we declare peace. You know, what's the point? The point is this. You and I, church, are called to walk into the darkest atmospheres. When the atmospheres are charged with uncertainty, fear has gripped people, where, there's, uh, where you feel like destiny has been robbed, look what happens. As soon as Jesus declared peace, I believe something shifted in that atmosphere. He spoke peace, the spirit that breaks down chaos. Something shifted and immediately... He showed his hands and his side. Immediately, when he, after he spoke peace, there was a revelation of Jesus Christ for that situation. And as soon as there was a revelation of Jesus Christ for that situation, what took place? Joy came in. Hope came in. They were jo joyful. For me, this is such a prophetic picture. That when you and I, no matter what is taking place in our nation, if you and I walk into a place and we declare peace, I believe immediately there will be a revelation 
of the nature and the person of Jesus Christ. And with that, hope would arise, joy would come, destiny and, you know, purpose and vision would just really come in. All because we decided to speak peace and come against the tense atmospheres that are surrounding or the dark atmospheres that are surrounding a nation and a culture. I am so excited in this time to really see God's word come to life, church. So what would this look like practically? I know much was shared. I know you've heard a lot of this before, but how do we apply this practically? And I just want to keep a few simple things that if we could really uh, take ownership of on this journey for our nation. The first one is be aware that the Prince of Peace lives in you. You know, we got to be aware, church, that the Prince of Peace lives in you and lives in me. See, we cannot give out what we don't know we have. There is something so important of being aware. Right? And when we are aware of Him living in us and working through us, everything changes. See, Jesus modeled this so well. He was able to sleep in the storm. And how was he able to sleep in a storm? How was he not affected? Because Jesus cultivated a lifestyle in the presence of the Lord. And because of his, of his relationship with, with the Father, the internal realities of Jesus was greater than the external reality. And this is why the scripture says, he that is in us is greater and mightier than he that is in the world. See, remember, light is greater than darkness. Light dispels darkness. And we have the Prince of Peace living in us. And when we are aware of that, everything changes. So may I encourage you to be aware, to be aware of the Prince of Peace living in you. The second practical step is be intentional to invite and engage with him as the Prince of Peace into the different situations of our lives. You know, be intentional to invite and engage and talk to him as the Prince of Peace. Isn't it, isn't it uh, amazing, church, that we are very quick to invite him as the God who provides, as Jehovah Jireh. Or we would say, you are the God that heals, Jehovah Rapha. But do we find ourselves saying, you are the God of peace, the Prince of Peace. And inviting him as the Prince of Peace into our own lives, into our own brokenness, into our marriages that are needing fixing, into our relationships that children that need gluing. Do we invite him as the Prince of Peace? And may I encourage you to engage with him as the Prince of Peace. Engage with him to walk into our nation as the Prince of Peace. To walk into the economy as the Prince of Peace. To walk into the weakening of the rupee as the Prince of Peace, to walk into the farming community as the Prince of Peace. And can I encourage you to do that? To, to engage with Him on a day-to-day -day basis, even as you fast, even as you pray for our nation. Engage with Him as the Prince of Peace. The third practical step is, can we boldly stand up and declare peace, be still, over the storms which we're seeing in this nation. As a family in the, re in the recent past, we have started making this uh, you know, very much part of our evening prayers. And we would purposefully, intentionally, stubbornly, you know, put our hands out and just say, peace be still. And we would be aware that he's a Prince of Peace. We would remind ourselves that when we declare peace, we're saying we're releasing the, the spirit that breaks down chaos, which is him, into the atmosphere, into the surroundings, the power of, of the presence of Jesus. We're, we're, we're declaring that and releasing that into the atmosphere. So, so we're very intentional that we just every evening we would say, peace be still over the storm. And we, we watched, uh, you know, the seven o'clock news with the kids and, and then we would say, okay, what were the things that we saw that we need to declare peace into? And we would declare the peace of God very intentionally. And, and may I encourage you, you know, we saw this story in Mark chapter 4 that, that whenever there is 
warfare against the destiny of a nation. Peace is one of the key weapons that we can use to enable us to get to the other side. Okay, so may I encourage you, please release and pray the power of, the, uh, of, of peace, the power of uh, the, uh, the Prince of Peace to walk in to every situation of our nation. So even as we do that, you know, please declare peace over the economy. Please declare peace over, over the nation, over the government, over the different situations. Be aware and engage even as you intercede and pray. End it with a declaration of peace. Not only that, one last point is also declare peace over your own self, over your own life. That God would calm the storms in you and in me, in our homes, in our marriages. That the peace of God would rest in all our homes. I believe if our homes are transformed, our nation will be transformed. So church, today, my friends, today, I just want to keep these thoughts with you. You know that He is the God of peace. And I believe, I'm excited because I am thinking, what would it look like if a community of believers could stand against the storms that we're seeing and intentionally say, we are going to declare peace. We're going to pray the power, of, uh, the, the power of the Prince of Peace over our situations and our nation and our lives. Just imagine, church, what is going to take place. Just imagine, I'm excited to see the transformation, the healing, the revelation of Jesus Christ which will unfold even as we declare peace. Can I pray with you? Let's just pray together. Father, we just thank you. Jesus, we thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. Jesus, we welcome you as a Prince of Peace. We thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. We love you, Prince of Peace. We thank you, Jesus, that you have commissioned us and you have given us your peace. And you said, my peace, I leave with you. We thank you for that peace. We thank you for the gift of peace that you've given us. And Jesus, you have said, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. We thank you for the equipping. We thank you for the commissioning. And Father, today, I pray that every one of us, Lord, would walk in that authority. Lord, that we would carry the anointing, the grace, the truth, to be able to sleep through the storms and to be able to rise up and declare peace be still wherever there is uh, peace uh, wherever there is a uh, war and warfare against the destiny of our nation that lord you would give us the courage to declare peace to to still the storm in jesus name lord i thank you for this and father today as a community of, as believers in agreement we declare together and we say peace be still over Sri Lanka. Let's just say that together. Peace be still over Sri Lanka. Let's say peace be still over economy. Peace be still over the economy of our nation. Peace be still over the COVID situation. Peace be still of the weakening of the rupee. Peace be still over the destiny of our nation and our generations. Peace be still over the future of our children. We thank you that you are the God of peace and that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under our feet. We thank you for this. We praise you. We bless you. God bless you, church, and peace be still in Jesus' name. Open heavens over me.
Yes, I 